I'm Deborah Davidson. If you don't know me, I'm the founder and director of Catalyst Conversations. I'm really happy to be here at the, um, the list for our uh, 17th public event, A Big Conversation About STEAM, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Art, and Math. And it's been organized in collaboration with the Cambridge Creativity Commons and the Agenda for Children. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, the list again, and especially Courtney Clemens, who has worked with us in creating this event here, um, and Director Paul Ha. Um, I'd also like to thank the Cambridge Arts Council, our founding partner and fiscal agent and funder, as well as the Catalyst Conversation Advisory Board for their advice and connections and feedback. There's a commonality in the discovery process and creative drive in both art and science. And I, that came up a lot in the discussion earlier of, of really a parity or the desire for parity between art and science. Not that the arts are serving science, but that there's a real, uh, a real synergy between the two. And I think that's a, a really great goal. Um, and partly that's what this conversation is about. Um, and we're going to um, today continue this discourse. As I said, we, were, we addressed it some in the um, earlier part, and we'd like to continue that in this uh, six to seven uh, portion. Um, all the programs that we uh, create um, express the idea that both art and science seek to comprehend our world and ourselves. Catalyst Conversations normally presents artists whose work resonates with science, really kind of a one-on-one. -on -one. And this afternoon and evening, we are expanding that definition of, of what we do by inviting um, th these two groups of a really terrific thinkers, practitioners, and earlier we had a few students uh, engaging, um, thinking about engaging the arts with science. Uh, so again, our, our group this um, now will present uh, very briefly as an introduction to themselves, and then they'll have an opportunity to have um, a conversation with each other, and then towards the end, a Q&A with you. Um, again, I won't have time to read all the bios, which are all long and illustrious, but um, you will find um, their, the bios on the back of the program we uh, created, and um, we made a STEAM page, which will stay on our website, uh, with lots of links and ideas and resources and the bios. Uh, this evening, we'll first have greetings from the City of Cambridge Vice Mayor Dennis Benzin, then Martha McKenna, uh, first person to my right, uh, University Professor and Director of the Creativity Commons at Lesley University, will say a few more remarks to begin, and then she will act as our moderator. And let's see if we're in order here. So to uh, her right is Gavin Andrews, who's the Assistant Director for Family, Student, and Teacher Programs from the Peabody Essex Museum. Diane Daly, who's the Education Programs Manager from the Mass Cultural Council. Um, Scott Osterweil, who's the Creative Director of the Education Archive, Research Director at the Comparative Media Studies here at MIT. We have Saeed Arida, who's the Founder and Chief Excitement Officer. Um, that is just an amazing title <laughs> at NUVU, and he will explain to us what both those things are. And uh, at the end of the table is Leela Kinney, who's the Executive Director of Arts Initiatives at MIT Center for Art, Science, and Technology, also known as CAST. So um, without further ado, uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Deborah. Good evening, everyone. So I wanted to uh, thank uh, the Cambridge Arts Council, uh, Jason, uh, for all the work that you do around STEAM. I want to also thank uh, the Cambridge Community Foundation, uh, Bob and uh, Creativity Commons, Kyle and Martha, as well as uh, the Cambridge Agenda for Children, uh, Kari Milner and Susan Richards, uh, who I've, I've known from pretty much most of my, my life. And uh, you know, this work is, is incredibly uh, important. Uh, and so I want to really thank all of you for being here uh, today uh, because this work um, is, uh, would not be happening without you and without your effort. And so I want you to know that uh, I certainly appreciate it and uh, those on the council and, and others in our city administration appreciate the work that you're doing. You know, I grew up just right behind here uh, about 
two blocks from Newtown Court in Washington Elms, uh, which is surrounded by um, you know, many of the most prosperous companies in the world, like Novartis and Google. And as a, a young kid, I would ride my bike with my friends over by uh, Draper Labs. And when, back in the mid 80s, um, much of what we consider Kendall Square today was not there, except for um, Draper Labs and a couple of other uh, <clears throat> companies. And when you think about this work, I want you to kind of think about this image a little bit. And that is, um, you know, we would pull up to uh, the window at Draper Labs and we would peer through the window. And we would always ask ourselves as kids, you know, what are they making in there? And we had heard that they made, you know, bombs um, and that they made nuclear weapons. And as you know, during the 80s, we were going through the Cold War. And, and sometimes in our conversation, we would say to each other that we were going to get bombed by the Russians. And we would uh, quickly say that, no, we were, we're not going to get bombed because we have Draper Labs and we have bombs too. And you know our connection with at the time, which uh, we consider you know STEM education or, or science, um, was really just peering through the window. And nowadays um, we have a, a very strong innovation economy in our city. And just this past weekend, I was part of a panel uh, where we discussed incarceration and we discussed a school to prison pipeline. And I, this work is important because you know this is our school to innovation economy pipeline. And this is the, the work that's gonna alleviate many of the problems that we have in our community. And all the kids that are growing up in, in Newtown Court and Wasson Elms and Wrench Towers and Roosevelt Towers, everywhere in our city, uh, regardless of, of you know, your ethnicity or your race or religion, um, many of our kids and, and, our, and our adults uh, do not have access to this economy. And the only way that they're gonna have access is, is through the work that you're doing. Uh, and through the work that we do on the council and that we do in our schools. And you know, this work is, is too important at a time when we're losing a lot of families in our city, housing prices are going up. Uh, much of the, the workforce in our city is made up of uh, folks that come into our city to work. I mean, if you, get up, if you stand by the platform in Kendall Square on any given morning, uh, a lot of the folks that are getting off these trains are not um, folks that uh, you know live in our city, but they're getting off the train, coming into work, and then they're leaving our city. And so we've got to do a better job of, of connecting um, our neighborhoods with the innovation economy. And uh, you know, and this is work that's even more important because, as you know, um, you know, recently the Supreme Court uh, ruled on uh, an affirmative action program at the University of Michigan which means that, that families that are struggling uh, and throughout this country are gonna have less and less access uh, to education. And it's becoming increasingly harder for them to have access to education, which means that we need to create programs in our city uh, that give our kids a chance and an opportunity. And one of those places uh, that I've been pushing for is the creation of steam at a STEAM center at the Foundry Building. And many of you are familiar with, with, with this uh, initiative. And you know, I'm of the opinion that we don't need one STEAM center, we need several STEAM centers around our city uh, that give access to our residents, and not so much just the, the high tech community that already has access, but really our, our residents. So um, you know, I wanna uh, just really thank you uh, for all your work, and, uh, and don't stop, and whatever um, we can do on the council uh, to be supportive of your work, uh, we will do that. Uh, and in the end, uh, we will create more and more opportunities uh, for, for our residents. So uh, thank you so much. Good afternoon, I'm Martha McKenna, and I direct a Center for Creativity at Lesley University. And the center was created in order to spark innovation in teaching and learning across the disciplines. So I am, took as my uh, model for creating that center the, the Art Science Lab of David Edwards at Harvard. And if, I'm sure if he weren't in Paris, he'd be part of our table today because we've got some of the best minds uh, to talk with you this afternoon. But he talks about the importance of this arts science collaboration. He said, in the best collaborations, the distinction between art and science disappears. And the creator is free to develop an idea without having to label it in one way or another. As Edwards noted, ultimately, you're exposing the really rich intellectual space between the arts and the scientists. One of the things that we've seen is that in the heart 
of the process of these experiments, it's hard to know who is the artist and who is the scientist. This is a mutually creative, analytical, and aesthetic process. And as we started to introduce ourselves at the table, we discovered how we were all artists and uh, innovators and scientists and educators, which you'll hear a little bit about. What better place to have this conversation than Cambridge, where some of the greatest minds in science are here at our universities, MIT, of course, Harvard, a little bit at Lesley in science education, um, but also the labs, the industry. It's a center for science. What better place for the arts? All of you who saw Time Magazine this week saw that Diana Paulus is considered one of the 100 most outstanding people in the world for the work that she's doing at the ART. So our visual and performing arts in Cambridge are quite extraordinary. We heard earlier from Kari that STEAM is a team. And that notion of collaboration, of bringing the artists and the scientists together is critical. We talk about catalyst, which is a spark. We talk about steam, which comes from bubbling. The, what you're going to hear this afternoon from this wonderful group of people is what happens when we bring the artists and the scientists together. Something magical, something terrific. And now, without further ado, we're going to hear from our panel and the work they're doing. Gavin? Hi there, I'm Gavin Andrews from the Peabody Essex Museum. How many of you have been um, way far north to Salem, Mass, to the Peabody Essex Museum? Great, excellent, I'm so thrilled to hear that. Um, some of you may know that uh, the museum is actually the oldest continuously operating museum in the United States. We were founded in 1799 by uh, sea captains sailing from Salem to Indonesia, to Japan, to China, and part of their goal was not just to trade and, and develop commerce, but to bring the world back to Salem. Um, and they were so interested in this exchange of ideas, and even today, that's a big part of who we are and what we want to do. And a lot of that you can see through our exhibitions and through the education um, programming that we offer. This is just an aerial shot of the museum to give you a sense of scale. and. These are our wonderful community members lining up on um, an event day. And in terms of working with community, we have a wide range of programs that throughout the course of this discussion I hope to be able to mention. But for us, the big ideas are what matter. And encouraging young people in particular, we focus a lot on K through 12 and increasingly um, with university students, both in in-school and out-of-school programs and engaging them in creative and critical thinking, whether it's looking critically and discussing their perspectives on what they see in the gallery, or teaching them new skills in the form of art making so that they can express themselves creatively, whether it's an art idea or a technical idea or a science idea. Um, we have two primary locations where I could easily call out, and I think any of you could call out and say, yep, this is STEAM. They're doing STEAM here. And one of them is our Art and Nature Center, which is an interdisciplinary um, education space where we host on a rotating basis contemporary art exhibitions that examine the intersections between art, science, and natural history. Um, right now, we have a show that's looking at the question whether humans are the only creatures that make art. Do animals make art as well? So come and join us at PEM and you can unpack that idea with us. And the other space, which is um, hot off the presses, it's been open for about six weeks, is our new Maker Lounge. And the Maker Lounge was really developed rather quickly out of this increasing itch that we wanted to scratch, um, which is about what is this intersection of art um, science, technology, engineering, and math, and how can we examine these creative disciplines, these creative um, design elements that cover each of these disciplines in the pursuit of creative expression. Um, some people, somebody mentioned earlier circuit stickers. This is um, circuit stickers that we worked with someone from the MIT Media Lab who um, actually has been manufacturing these. Um, this image on the right. So we're doing a wide range of programming, both um, with artists and scientists that are coming into our space to develop programming um, on a drop-in basis, and also with uh, after-school programs and with schools, but also um, self-guided or unfacilitated programming in the form of design challenges. Right now, our design challenges are focused on um, architecture, computational thinking, and um, industrial prototyping. 
Um, so there's an uh, interest for us to think about what are the um, low-tech and high-tech types of materials and resources that we can combine in the pursuit of um, creative expression. And pass it on to Diane. <laughs> Um, so it's great to be here. Uh, I'm Diane Daly. I'm the Education Programs Manager at the Massachusetts Cultural Council. How many of you know what the Massachusetts Cultural Council is? Oh, excellent. And so for those of you that don't, it's your state agency that is responsible for promoting the arts and the sciences, and here it comes, and the humanities. Who had the humanities question? Uh, and the humanities in the Commonwealth. Um, and we do that using your tax dollars through the state as well as money that comes to us um, from the National Endowment for the Arts. And the reason that we exist is because there is a, a definite commitment to the idea that the arts and the sciences and the humanities are who we are. And as, on that basis, they are the drivers of healthy economies, healthy communities, creative communities, and creative minds. And so we see that as our entire mission, is to, in every place in the Commonwealth, support work and thinking and learning and creativity and products and connection around these three areas. Um, we do that by supporting 400 organizations in the arts, science, and the humanities, 750 and more schools. Each community in the Commonwealth has got a local cultural council. We're the only state in the country that's got that, just like we're the only state in the country that has an agency that's uh, supporting the arts and the sciences and the humanities. Most of them are arts, all the rest of them are arts councils. Um, so the local cultural councils take money from the MCC and regrant it in a way that supports the work that's going on in the communities and the learning and how that community wants to see it. Individual artists we support and we support economic development in the communities around the, around the state. Um, so from our perspective, art is central. So to say steam, steam what, not steam, or steam, or whatever you want to call it, um, you know, it's really not the question. The question is, how do we use all of the resources available to us as human beings to achieve our goals? Um, and so on that basis, it's a both and and an all of the above in a way that makes sense in each of those individual situations that are challenged or opportunities or whatever we are wanting to create. Um, I just am throwing this up because I want to let you know that there's a, a STEAM caucus down at, the, uh, um, at our, our, what do we call it, our Congress down in Washington, D.C., so this conversation is going on, as you know, all over the country. Um, and why the arts? You've seen all of these charts. It's because the arts, and I'm going to say, and the sciences and the humanities are all about creative minds. So it's envisioning, you know, you know all these things. I don't need to, to, um, to add it. So, so um, thank you for the opportunity to be here for this conversation today. I want to say that um, we, Martha wanted me to say this, um, we, as, as, a, as an agency that's res that promotes all of these, these opportunities, um, decided that we needed to start a statewide conversation so that we could understand what was going on in the various communities. And we, did, we, we had a conversation about a year ago and brought people into the, to the room and say, what's happening and why is it happening and where can we as a state agency be, be helpful in this? And I want to say that this conversation that's going on here in this community is stellar and it's where it's happening it's where it's where we're going to make the movement that we need to make so thank you I didn't bring slides so I'm not going to get up is the mic on can you hear me yeah. okay great so I'm Scott Osterweil I design games I've been designing games for about 20 years um, most of them have been around what are I guess stem topics math and science but my own background was in theater so to me, the convergence of art and math and science has always been uh, 
interesting and always worth in, in exploring. And, and just so that I'll be brief just to get us to the conversation quicker. But um, from my perspective, what because I know when I mentioned games, you probably all have very different images in your minds of what games are about and what games for learning are about. So to simplify things, let me just say that I think of games as um, being for one thing only, which is sort of, uh, well, I mean, games are for play, but my goal through that play is for fostering lifelong curiosity, lifelong learning, and lifelong invention. And uh, it doesn't matter in what domain those things happen. And, and I assume that they happen, as the, as the original quote mentioned, that they happen in the space between art and science. So I'll pass the mic with that. Thank you. Yep. Uh, so I come from, I'm Saeed, I come from this place called uh, Novo. I'm going to tell you, very kind of give you a quick introduction to it. Uh, the main focus for us is to teach uh, students how to go through uh, a messy process like this one. Everybody knows probably how, if you are in the creative field, you probably banged your head against the wall many times and you go through this maze, but ultimately you get to something. And I spent around uh, six years of my PhD life here in the architecture school trying to uh, prove to people hypothetically that you can actually teach this to people. And then I started at school after that. Uh, so the, the, the whole pedagogy that we have at Nuvo is based on the architecture studio model. It, it's this, uh, you have this intense kind of iterative process uh, in which uh, you produce something not knowing even anything. They tell you to design a toy or a house or something without giving you any notions of what that thing is and you make it. And then you go through uh, intense critique process basically and within three, four months you finally get to something that actually looks pretty cool. Uh, so for us this is kind of teaching uh, students how to go through uh, a creative process like this. And critique is really the, the, the main focus for us is uh, how to uh, kind of teach teachers and students how to engage in this kind of critique process that is very productive and constructive. So the idea is that students receive that feedback and synthesize it into the basically the second iteration and they make a lot of design decisions along the way. And so the idea, if you go to, back to the previous slide, is that at every stage we want them to keep track of this, uh, of all these design decisions. Uh, this is the space that we have. It's, it's, I think it's unexpected a little bit because it's in Central Square. It's a uh, if you know Moxa and Veggie Galaxy, it's exactly on top of that. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty cool space, and uh, when we moved in there, we, we since I'm an architect, I, that's the only useful thing I got from <laughs> being an architect. You know, I wanted to make sure that the space was actually pretty cool. Uh, so it's an open space where everybody is working on many different things at the same time, and probably the space can tell you there's the robots, there's the, the art stuff, and the music, and the 3D printing, and the shop, and everything is happening at the same time. Uh, uh, all of that, so since uh, I said space on the studio model, our studios run only for two weeks, so the students, uh, uh, we have around 35 students in the, it's uh, what I usually tend to call Nouveau a boutique school. We are actually not set up as a school, we are set up as a private company, which means we can experiment with all the kids and nobody is going to sue us, which is a good thing. Uh, so uh, every two weeks, basically, the students are giving a problem and they have to solve it at the end of two weeks. Uh, so as you can see, all the projects that I'm going to show here, they start with a sketch on the top left and they end up with a pretty kind of refined Thing. This, is, this studio, all of our studios are usually taught by two people from very different backgrounds. So this one was taught by a, a, a medical doctor and a roboticist. And the student came up with this idea of, a, of an advanced cane that for his granddad. That is pretty cool, 3D printed and electronics and sensors and all of that. This is another one. Uh, we have a partnership with the Boston Fashion Week, so every kind of November we have five dresses of the students' work and we have actual models on the runway. And these are also, we, we like uh, fashion in this way because it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of robotics in it, a lot of laser cutting and 3D modeling and all of that. So it combines really all of the stuff that we are talking about here. Uh, this is one of the uh, more incredible things that we've been doing recently, which is the DIY prosthetics. and. Uh, uh, you know, this 
students basically are using the, the tools that, uh, and the processes that we are teaching them and uh, uh, producing stuff for other kids. So we were working with this kid, uh, Leon, who's uh, amputated, who he does not have fingers. So they designed this uh, artistic hand for it. So you can see how it kind of has a ratchet. So as you kind of rotate the ratchet, it's, uh, uh, it, you can use different tools on it. And he's kind of using it to draw his name at the bottom. So for us to take kids from that inspirational image that you see, the left, go through all the iterations, and you get to something that is as connected to how they feel about the world as possible. This is kind of what we want to do. Thank you. Thank you. To do a quick switch here. Thank you. I'm Leela. I want to say a few words about the arts at MIT, what we uh, do here. First of all, the kind of STEAM curriculum that we have at MIT. Second, our Center for Art, Science, and Technology, which tries to make sure that these things are embedded throughout the research and education of the Institute. Third, how we use visiting artists in this context. And then I want to invite you to a symposium next September uh, 26th to 27th. And to a Hacking Arts event on October uh, 3rd for a weekend, which programmatically puts artists, engineers, and entrepreneurs together. It's run by students in the Sloan School. So that's the overview in case I don't get through it in two minutes. I just wanted to say briefly that there is a, a strong legacy of this tradition of combining sciences and arts at MIT. Our motto is actually mens et manus, mind and hand. A lot of people forget this, but in the original seal, it said sciences and arts. It was always intended to be a combination, not just the useful arts, but the fine arts and architecture. We have the oldest program in the country. What's so interesting about MIT students today and this is why I think the STEM STEAM, um, initiative is so important, is that we are seeing increasingly students come who have a combination of technical skills and this not only practice experience in the arts, but drive for creativity. Since I've been in this position, I've been tracking um, students, incoming students. There's a phenomenal level of interest in the arts in, among freshmen. The enrollments in arts subjects are over half of all undergraduates take one voluntarily each year. And we now actually have a requirement in our general institute requirements in our core curriculum that all students take an arts class. You can see here, the reason these don't add up to 100% um, is that you can be active in more than one arts field as undergraduates. No surprise, music is the strongest. It's cliche, but it's true. You're good in music, you're good in math. This is sort of steady state for about five years now. It's actually, these are kind of extraordinary uh, statistics because these kids are also, you know, off the charts in science and math. Here's our core curriculum. It's been this way for quite some time. It's incredibly balanced. So we take all these science, this is the 17 required uh, courses before you declare your major or by the time you graduate. Very balanced between humanities, arts, and social sciences and uh, the sciences and math. A lot of it goes back to this guy, 13th president of MIT. Can't tell you about him, but it's kind of embedded in our culture. So the Center for Art, Science, and Technology is a Mellon-funded initiative that is in, in designed to be the sort of latest iteration of this. It's really to continue this tradition of hands-on learning and to make sure that there are costs disciplinary courses uh, throughout the institute. Everything from learning how to exhibit and display science, um, which often is, is taught by the director of the MIT Museum, uh, John Durant, these are courses that CAS supports, or this wonderful course, Design Across Scales, by an architect and um, uh, uh, designer in the Media Lab, which programmatically puts students from all across the institute together. This is a um, a visualization of climate change. You'll see how long it takes Boston to disappear. You'll be happy to know. <laughs> but anyway, this is a class that puts uh, teams of students together to do uh, various uh, projects. The first one is data visualization. The second one is make something that makes something and then make something with it. And the third is a game. Uh, doesn't necessarily have to be a virtual game. Uh, we also, um, uh, 
uh, sponsor of classes in, for example, in the Center for uh, Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab about various sort of folding mechanisms. You may have heard of the work of Eric Demain, who is an expert in computational origami and is one of these people, as uh, Scott says, you can't tell where the art begins and the science begins. They're entirely merged together in his work. Finally, Deborah wanted me to say a few words about how we embed visiting artists into our uh, research and teaching. This is just a tiny excerpt of um, a larger visiting artist video about the work of artists in our labs. This is by the artist, uh, uh, probably the best known Brazilian artist, Vic Muniz, who's based in Brooklyn, but also back and forth. He came to, here, to MIT and did two things. One is he worked with the synthetic biology, uh, biology lab to make portraits out of bacteria. And the other is that he uh, decided to etch a drawing of a sandcastle on a grain of sand. So let me show you just a little excerpt of A lot of, of my work is trying to figure out interesting ways to combine materials with computers. And through the research, I found out about Vic's work. They sent Vic an email. Immediately, he responded. He's like, yes, I want to come by. I've, I've heard about MIT and the Media Lab for a long time. This is a highly abstracted image because what's going on is that system there is throwing charged particles of gallium at the surface. Vic has this vision of etching castles into grains of sand. And he asked me, like, can we do this at MIT? Is there a way that we can make an image that's so small that we can actually put it onto a grain? We've been going through all these different kinds of equipment, creating really good techniques. So you get an idea of this. And then finally, as I said, I just want to invite you to come to this symposium uh, in September, two days, where we're putting artists, scientists, and uh, cognitive scientists in particular, and humanists and scholars together to talk about these various overlaps based on three themes, seeing, sounding, and sensing. Thank you. You can imagine how how difficult it is to have these people who are doing such important work and giving, asking them to speak quickly. So we're going to engage in a, a dialogue for the next few minutes. Um, and I'm going to start by asking the question, what does STEAM mean to you and your organization? Anyone? What does STEAM mean to you and your organization? Uh, huh? Saeed? Uh, probably we never think about it. I think it's this is that we just do it. Uh, you know, for us, what, what's been interesting is that, uh, you know, usually if you go to high schools and, uh, uh, in, you know, we do a lot of technology with, uh, at Nuvo, so if we brand it as, 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 you know, robotics, then probably, or technology, then we're going to get only get the nerdy boys. You know, but I think what we've been kind of, What's been interesting at Nuvu is that you know when you when everybody enters through a creativity lens, so it does not really matter. You know, like the idea is that you are coming up with an idea and then you have to execute the idea at the end. And in the middle, like this whole kind of maze, you would need a lot of uh, tools basically to execute. Sometimes you need to to express an idea in some way and sketch it, and another way you need to run a science experiment to do something and some other way you need to 3D print and stuff and to get to the end. So I think it's, it's embedded that we are using all of these, but we kind of never talk about it. It's holistic. Theory. Exactly, yeah. Anyway, uh, Gavin? It's definitely similar for us. And, you know, I have to admit over the past several years, a STEAM has really become a thing. Um, we're sort of looking at ourselves at the Peabody Essex Museum saying, well, yeah, we've been doing this for a long time. We've been thinking and making and playing and experimenting across these disciplines in a holistic, and I think somebody used that word earlier today, um, in natural way that feels very authentic. Um, and it's just that now we start to have kind of like a hashtag for it. Um, you know, if, if you do hashtag STEAM on Twitter, it's kind of crazy all the things that you see that come up and what people are talking about. And as we develop a shared language for what this means, I think it is community driven in terms of what the needs are for the community and understanding how we think in this way and explore and experience. Um, but there are multiple meanings to what STEAM means. Um, and, I, and I don't want to change the topic, but I, I think one thing that I 
question about the idea of STEAM is that STEM came first as an acronym and by placing the A, um, in some ways it does place arts in service of STEM. And so how can we change the meaning a little bit? And, and that's, you know, as an artist, as an arts educator, that's always going to be my lens. Um, I, I don't think that always actually plays out. I think the arts are very supported and vibrant, especially by all the folks in this room. But it's just, you know, something to think about how, how we, what the terminology is and what we mean. I mean, the thing that I'd, I'd love to challenge in the terminology, if you think about it, uh, the derivation of, of talking about STEM was connected with kids and education and their careers and the future and a very utilitarian view of education. Mm -hmm. And I would really argue that, the, that it's a, a fool's errand asking kids to sort of pick career, to, to look at their education as planning for a career because as I tell them, I'm a game designer, that career didn't exist when I graduated college. Um, and so what, if we refine what we're talking about, we're not talking about uh, sort of education for your future career, but rather education for how to live your life, mm -hmm. then the room for STEAM sort of becomes natural. And then, it, I mean, at that point, I don't know whether you even call it STEAM anymore, but. Uh, yeah, I was going to say that it is, it, there are many places in communities where it's just happening because that's the way people do their work. That's the way a museum does its work. That's at Berkshire Museum out in, the, in, in Pittsfield, Art and Science, Peabody Essex Museum. You know, there are the, the various industries around that are doing, but I think we sort of get the, the STEM, STEAM thing because we're trying to look at what the feeders are to that. You know, who, who, where are we going to get these new creative thinkers? You know, we have some, but we're going, we, we absolutely, we're desperate for them. So that's what it's, why it's important to the Massachusetts Cultural Council because, you know, we have a, we have a future that we need to be preparing for and getting our, giving our children the opportunity to succeed in, and, and in whatever place that it happens in their life. Um, I have a personal uh, commitment to it because, because I think it is about creativity, and I think that we, we miss that in our education system at the moment, except for it does happen in many places, but they're classroom by classroom by classroom or individual schools. Mm -hmm. So it's about taking those opportunities, those, those um, places, and extending it throughout the community, throughout the schools, in whatever form schools tend to look like in the next coming years. Oh, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yes, I want to agree that we just do it. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I guess what I want to stress, I agree with the problems with the acronym, and it tends to put these in these separate categories. What interests me is the combination in the individual students and getting people to sort of learn. That's what's most interesting. Or the combination through partnerships and teams of putting different kinds of people with different approaches and backgrounds together. I think that is one of the most exciting things to see what emerges in context like that. So programmed cross-disciplinary uh, teaching and research, but also getting people to discover those different strands in themselves. So I'm not the artist and you're not the this and the whatever. It's the combination that's interesting. At the Creativity Commons, we talk about creative process as pedagogy, and I think we've heard that among all of you as well. And we define that as first imagining what an artist would do. You have to imagine what's possible that doesn't exist. You then have to go through a process of creating, a process of critiquing, where you look back and reflect and make it stronger, um, and then exhibiting, sharing it with others. And I think that notion of creative process, I've heard from all of you as well. The, you just mentioned partnership, and I think that's really important. What have been some of the creative partnerships that you've um, experienced in your organizations that have moved forward this STEAM initiative, or science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics? Anyone want to work? Okay. Um, well, I was thinking about this in terms of sort of what are what's happening around the state. So, of course, you have your wonderful creativity um, expanded learning STEAM network here in in Cambridge, and you also have this this 
catalyst conversation. There's there's a lot going on there. Um, we ha we have a place like the Orchard Garden School in in downtown Boston. We've got um, the uh, Art of Science Learning out in Worcester, which is the one of three places in the country that National Science Foundation is funding. It's an in incubator around the, the confluence of art and science around specific issues. They've taken technology um, transportation as their issue. We've got uh, a theater and a, a environmental center working together in Holyoke and Amherst to sort of bring science to students in those those schools that are in a way that is accessible whether your access is through the science particularly or your access may be more through the art in in a way that's about learning so there's Swiss necks here too so the, you know there's a lot of places um, we've just started kind of an informal relationship with our local university in Salem, Salem State University, um, and I've been working closely with a biology professor who is interested in STEAM, but from her angle. Um, and so we've been doing a lot of research and, and testing out together, and um, one of the things that we've been able to pull off that I'm really excited about that helps define our partnership is that in the fall, um, she'll be on sabbatical from Salem State, and she'll actually be a scientist in residence at the museum. Museum. And part of what she'll be doing is um, working with our natural history collection, doing some research, but also working with our um, educators to examine what are the scientific concepts that we could explore more deeply through exploration in our galleries. And so by bringing on someone who has such um, specific expertise in an area that we clearly don't, um, we hope to really strengthen what we can offer in our galleries and also in support of what educators want to bring into their classrooms that is um, integrated across art and science. Great. Said? Uh, we actually kind of created an, 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 uh, an environment for us that would allow us to do this by default. So we are full -time, five full-time people who are both designers and, and, and roboticists, uh, but we have uh, like three people rotating every two weeks. So if you want to do something about medical devices, we make sure to get a medical doctor to help us. If we are doing a video game, we get a video game designer. So we are always kind of connected. But on a, on a larger scale, for instance, we did something, a collaboration with the Arboretum and the MetaLab at Harvard. We designed these robots that live in the, uh, in the park that measure certain things about, about the environment and reports like online somewhere. So you know, the, the Boston Fashion Week has been like pretty incredible too. So we do a lot of, a lot of these things. When when we do a collaboration, in, in any game we do, we do it in collaboration with people who, who know a subject area. So uh, I always start, if I'm doing a, it's like I did a game with the Smithsonian and I went with, met with a bunch of their scientists. I start by asking each of them, um, where's the game in your work? And they usually give me a, a blank stare. And then I say, well, what do you think about when you're out for a, sh when you're taking a shower or you're out for a run? And gradually we start to find out where they actually play. And in mm -hmm. fact, where they play is where they do all their good work. Mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. and, so I, uh, and so we try to build games which let people play with all the serious stuff of the world. Um, mm -hmm. Because in fact, I guess to me the real operative word here, and maybe it's the hammer with which I hit all nails, but the operative word is play. Mm -hmm. Which is that in fact what's going on in art and in science and in engineering even, when you're a good engineer, is play. And that's what we really try to activate. So. And Layla, you live in a collaborative hole. Uh, yes, that's true. I wanted to say. <laughs> uh, well, there are lots of parts that we have to sometimes try to put together. But uh, uh, in addition to play, what I was going to say is this um, open-ended exploration of uh, not only we have a great. Um, Nobel laureate here, whose name is Jerry Friedman, a, an institute professor, and he had to decide when he was young whether to accept a full scholarship to the School of uh, the Art Institute of Chicago or to go to the University of Chicago and work in Fermi's lab, which he did, and he contributed to discovering quarks and became um, won a Nobel for that. But he's one of the greatest supporters of the arts at MIT, so one of the things he always said is it's so important to 
expose young minds to this because otherwise they'll only end up solving existing problems. They won't think of problems that don't exist. So it's this kind of spirit of exploration. And I'll just mention two other things, not to take too much time, but I have a lot of examples of visiting artists who've done these interesting things in our labs. We sort of, we do arranged marriages, I would say, for that. And it, it ends up being really interesting because they ask each other to do things that they wouldn't otherwise do. And the scientist in particular, we say, well, why, why have you opened your lab? Why are you interested in this? And they said, because it reminds us why we went into science. And for once, we don't have to do all these deliverables. And it opens up you know, all kinds of things and does contribute to PhD theses as well. For example, when an artist came in and said he wanted to make a nanoscale wafer size uh, sculpture of his mother's house, but it had to be pink. <laughs> you know, And the guy had never done color on the nanoscale. And then he figured it out, and it was in his thesis. One other thing that's kind of interesting that's in the community is the Cal Cal Catalyst Collaborative, which is distinctive, is distinct from the Cal Catalyst Conversations, which is an arts science, um, a theater sci a science initiative at the Central Square Theater. And what they do is they try to put on plays that further uh, the public understanding of science, uh, and then they bring in scientists to sort of lead community discussions about those issues. So I think those are two kind of interesting things. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask the last question and ask you to start since you said future. What is your vision for where we can go with this? I think that you, there's, this is a little bit of a marketing cliche, but it kind of stuck in my mind, maybe because of the T. I heard um, some marketing person say that the students of the future are going to be like a T. They're going to have this sort of deep skills and embedded knowledge, but be able to reach way out here to other fields. So that's what I see. These students coming, not so many distinctions between to, to follow on Scott's point about you're going to be programmed for this career track and that one, but you know to have you know definite bodies of knowledge and skill set. I'm not suggesting we go away from that, but then be able to apply it in all of these kind of unbounded ways. That's what I see. Great. I hope. <laughs> Anybody else for the vision? Uh, yeah, please. All right. Um, the earlier panel, I think it was Marlon who said something about, for him, you know, STEAM was about, um, or for, for kids who are working in art, maybe they're not going to be artists, but they're going to be positive members of society. And um, that really resonated with me because I feel like, at least as a museum, we're a place for community, we're, <clears throat> excuse me, a place for exploring and um, discovery across all of these disciplines and so STEAM for me and I think for the museum, um, if I may be so bold to speak on behalf of the entire Peabody Essex Museum, um, is, is really about this authentic exploration of ourselves and the world around us and whether it's you know working with someone in robotics to explore how we might create something or working with a sculptor, um, how can we develop ideas and um, solve problems that we don't know exist quite yet, but authentically create learners and people who want to contribute and um, be creative. And creative not being assigned just to the arts, but creative as a skill, as um, a top line goal for all of our young people. So I actually have a fairly radical view of this, so you'll forgive me, but right on the other side of one of these walls, are people inventing sort of the next generation of 3D printers, which are not what you think of when you think, I mean, we're talking about printing fabrics, printing circuits, we're talking about printers that will print other printers. Um, and where all that's going, uh, the, bad, the, the good news or the bad news, depending on how you want to look at it, is that much of the work of, the, much of what we call work nowadays, manufacturing, transportation, um, uh, retail, may all go away. It may all, we may actually have a world in which, you know, large amounts of what we need are produced down the end of the block, you know, with, the, with designs we uploaded, or maybe even in our own house. And, um, and that, could, that could either leave us with a world in which very few people have all the goods, or that could leave us with a world in which we all decide that the purpose of our life is not so much 
about the, the work we do, but rather the culture we create for each other. And that culture isn't just art, although I love art, but also whether we build cabinets or do the plumbing for our neighbor or, um, or build a tree house or design a park, that we're all going to, I think that there's going to be, in the better version of that future, there's going to be need for all of us to be uh, cultural producers. Um, and that, that to me is really the goal of, of the work that we're all doing is to, is to create that generation of producers. So. I have one up on you. What about self-assembling systems? That's coming. Right. Right. <laughs> so uh, I think we have a fantastic vision of the future and where we want to go. And I just want to bring us back just a little bit to, so what are sort of the next steps? And I think you hit on it, Martha, when you were talking about partnership, which is about we find out who's out there, who's doing what, and how can we connect together to, be, to get to that next step of whatever that is that we may not know. Uh, we may not all have to be science artists and all the rest of that stuff, but, but to be able to find out who, it, who has, who, it, well, I think your model is fantastic. It, you know, who, what's, the, what's the resource we need and who's got it out there and how do we get together to do it? Saeed, a vision? This is always a very hard question to answer, but it's, it's a, uh, I mean, I think when, when initially I created Nouveau and I wanted to keep it this, this uh, small is that, uh, I wanted to kind of show other schools that you can actually do schools in a very different way. And we have around like 100 schools that go through the space almost every year. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and for them, when they come, mostly what I have them do is talk to the students because the, you know that's when they kind of really get to see the impact that this is how they want their learning to be. Mm -hmm. And the idea, hopefully, that they can take that back to their schools and, and, and try to, to do more of these things. Leela? Saeed, Scott, Diane, and Gavin, would you please um, award them your applause for their wonderful presentation. <laughs> Terrific.